Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for coming. My name is George Dimakopoulos. I'm one of the co-directors of the Orthodox Christian Study Center. Uh, I'd like to recognize the presence of His Grace, Bishop Irene of the Serbian Orthodox Church, um, a member of our advisory council and a good friend. Thank you for joining us, Your Grace. Um, this evening, we have our very good friend, Davor Zalto, um, uh, a, a scholar uh, from the Serbian Orthodox Church, but who has really, he's studied all over the world, he's lectured all over the world, he's taught all over the world, uh, he's currently um, teaching in Sweden, that he was part of uh, really a groundbreaking project we did here over the past five years on uh, the intersection of orthodoxy and human rights. And he's going to give what is potentially one of the most provocative and, to my mind, really interesting takes on the relationship between Christianity and human rights um, with, with his lecture this evening. So let me read his formal um, short biography. Dr. Zalto is professor of religion, art, and democracy at the University College Stockholm. He is also president of the Institute of the Study of Culture and Christianity. Among his most recently published books are Anarchy and the Kingdom of God, from Eschatology to Orthodox Christian Political Theology and Back. That was published by Fordham University Press in 2021. And Beyond Capitalist Dystopia, Rethinking Freedom and Democracy in the Age of Global Crises. That was published in 2002. Davor and I actually published an edited volume of, et of essays on orthodoxy and fundamentalism in 2020, 21. Somewhere around there, 21, maybe 22. I can't remember. Um, anyway, it's really my uh, great joy to bring to bring him this evening um, for his talk on the need to reaffirm freedom, democracy, and human rights, and why it is so difficult to do that in the world of global capitalism. Oh. Thank you. You may want to save laughing for the end, because I'm not the one who tries to please uh, his audience at all costs. On the contrary, I very often try to antagonize the audience so that we can actually then uh, discuss it and maybe come to something, uh, some deeper insights. Thank you, uh, George, thank you, Telly, for uh, inviting me, uh, your grace, uh, Alex and friends, thank you for being here. Uh, this lecture will not really go into terribly deep stuff and ideas. We are going to talk mostly about things that I'm sure uh, all of you are to a certain extent familiar with, major ideological narratives, uh, how they are articulated, and uh, what can be deduced from them. And just here and there, there will be a little bit of theology in the background, but this is really mostly uh, about uh, uh, the current uh, predominant ideological paradigms, uh, what is their uh, deeper ideological setup, and what is that that we can, why they are so uh, destructive, and what is that that we can do about them. Uh, and I do hope that not too many of you are here because that was a requirement for a course. <laughs> uh, I mean, most of these things you can find anyway online or in my work, so I hope those assignments will, uh, you'll make them uh, relatively easy. So let's, let's begin. Like today, we are uh, faced with many crises, and if you think about it, uh, you very often hear about ecological crisis that itself has uh, many different dimensions. Economic crisis and also uh, more specific aspects of that, including poverty in many parts of the world and uh, even in the richest societies on this planet, you still find uh, extreme poverty, inequality, political tensions and wars. And of course you hear about the crisis of the uh, system of education, a crisis or collapse of the public sphere, and of course new threats to human dignity and human freedoms. And 
one of those crises that very often is in the media is a crisis of democracy and very often identified with a crisis of liberal democracy. And I'm going to talk more, more about that. So uh, in addition to so having all of these crises in mind, it is my approach, and I developed that in, in one of the books that, that uh, George mentioned, uh, we cannot seriously uh, address any of them, I think, unless we address the problem the issue of capitalism uh, as a system and as ideology. And of course, then the question really becomes, why uh, isn't capitalism wonderful? And I haven't really been told that it is the only functioning system that uh, brought up all the uh, blessings uh, to the world in the modern period. Well, actually, I don't think uh, it is. Uh, it is something that by design, I think, is anti-democratic, and it poses a threat to nature, human freedom, and human dignity. Why? What's the problem with capitalism? And of course, as I said, I'll just give you a couple of main ideas, and then during the discussion, there may just inspire uh, further discussion so that we can develop some of these points uh, more. So first of all, capitalism, uh, and I build here on the tradition that goes back to Marx, but primarily uh, it's Karl Polanyi who uh, developed it more in the 20th century. Uh, the problem of capitalism is really that it turns all the concrete stuff that's there, out there in the world, into abstractions. And if you think about it, uh, only under the capitalist regime, you can really turn everything into an abstraction called uh, value you can express in money, in cost, you know, everything can, there is a price tag that can be put to virtually anything, and then you can exchange everything in the world because of those abstractions. It also turns society into the function of the market and not vice versa. Uh, that is the discussion when people say, well, there was capitalism uh, before modernity as well. Not really, because the kind of capitalism that we have in the modern period uh, never really existed before. Uh, you had markets, that's not a problem, and you had rich people, that's not a problem, and you had private property also, but all of these things do not per se imply the existence of the capitalist system. Something needs to happen uh, for the capitalist system to be uh, established, and that is what um, I also call the double move that took place in the early modernity, and that is to take one function of society, and that is the market, and then uh, reduce actually the concept of economy that used to be much broader to just market and market forces, and then this terribly reduced concept of economy applied to everything, expanded so that everything in society becomes actually a function of the market. This is what we find in capitalism. And of course, we have this uh, ever-expanding uh, profits as the ultimate target of, uh, of the system. As such, which leads to this universal commodification. The things that were not designed to be commodities, they become commodities. Like, a commodity is normally defined as something that is produced to be exchanged on the market. Uh, you can produce something cheese, and then exchange it on the market, no problems there. But the problem with capitalist system, the things that are not designed to be exchanged on the market, such as land, or nature, or air, or human labor, they become also commodified, and they become treated as just any other commodity. And of course, such system requires constant expansion. And this is where capitalism actually aligns pretty well with the modern imperialisms and why Western imperial powers uh, were also in a way used or co-opted by the capital system because they actually grew hand in hand in this early period. And the result is this uh, profound dehumanization of the world and denaturalization, if you will, as well. So uh, in order to uh, address this we actually need to deconstruct dominant ideological narratives. Because as I'll try to, to show you, those dominant ideological narratives uh, are this way or the other, uh, 
related or stem from the capitalist uh, ideology as a more profound uh, set of ideas and also uh, institutions. Uh, we normally, when we talk about the Western context, we can talk about uh, two major ideological blocks. Uh, sometimes they're just called liberalism or neoliberalism, and of course there are people who claim that neoliberalism is something very different from liberalism, I'm not so certain. And there is something that's called conservatism or neoconservatism, uh, which supposedly is very different from liberalism. And that's, then you also have various authoritarianisms, and in the rest of the world also technical authoritarianism that mostly is associated with systems such as the Chinese. I'll focus more on neoliberalism here, because I think in many ways liberal ideology is uh, crucial for understanding what is happening or what has happened in the history of modernity. So liberalism is usually, people claim that it revolves around the two essential things. One is liberal democracy as a political system with its own set of institutions and procedures, such as parliamentary representative democracy, limited government, <coughs> rule of law, individual freedoms and rights, uh, freedom of speech expression, and it is very anti-authoritarian. And in addition to this, we have capitalism, or free market economy, as a fundamental dimension uh, built into the system of liberalism, and especially into the neoliberal version of it. This is also what you very often can find in the public sphere, in the media, and in scholarship, as the Western values. You know, one can think why these are specifically Western values and not some others, but we can discuss that uh, later on. Uh, historically speaking, these ideas that I just listed, they uh, came as a result of very complex developments. And one of them was uh, the opposition to absolute monarchy and autocracy, uh, which was the predominant type of government at the time when liberal ideas started to occur. Uh, if you think uh, of uh, European monarchies, absolute monarchies, and aristocracy uh, with inherited privileges uh, just because somebody belongs to a certain family, those things were uh, perceived as problematic and liberalism was good at addressing them. That also means that liberalism <coughs> became very skeptical of strong personalized authority. And liberals are generally, when you think about it, when there is one person who becomes so strong, there is almost a instinctual uh, questioning of that and a critical position toward that, precisely because of this historical uh, package. But then also, there was the opposition to arbitrariness in decision making, uh, which is attached to personal, strong personal uh, authority in politics such as king or strong president or whoever. Uh, and a preference for predictability in public affairs generally. That's also why uh, the rule of law. Uh, this together with the affirmation of individual uh, rights and primarily among them property rights. Uh, liberalism, and I think that is a really tragic thing, never parted from property as the fundamental aspect of this broader ideological setup. In addition to the rule of law, especially in the Anglo-Saxon tradition, there is the idea that uh, we also should uh, respect those unwritten codes, uh, so-called good practices of a democratic government. And this is what many uh, would claim nowadays uh, is being diminished when so many things are done that are not necessarily, strictly speaking, illegal, but go against well-established practices, how things are supposed to be done. Uh, neoliberal, uh, liberalism and neoliberalism also uh, prefer science and technology 
as something that is neutral or has this uh, 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 element of objectivity to it in its attempt to escape arbitrariness or something that is just a personal decision of those in power there is a, a structural preference for the use of science and affirmation of science including reliance on so-called human sciences or social sciences but that is also why there is a preference for the market and the idea that free market is there as a, something that is ideal of social relations. Why? Because supposedly, uh, in capitalist theory, and especially liberal uh, expressions of that, uh, there is a set of um, laws that govern the market that are very comparable, similar, similar to natural laws. And if you just uh, uh, take out all the political decision making, those laws will function perfectly and that will lead to the best possible social uh, environment. But this then leads to uh, an attempt to, to, to construct non-political politics. So that politics is there uh, not to be uh, the result of our discussions or deliberations, but something that just happens because it follows certain social laws that are uh, similar to national laws. Uh, and this is where, of course, the alliance of such uh, ideological uh, framework, conceptual framework, where there is the alliance with capitalism. Uh, and, of course, there are many different stages uh, in this development. I'm go not going to go through that. Uh, this, of course, and this is where theology uh, becomes important. Uh, there are a couple of, I think, fundamental paradoxes uh, in this whole Enlightenment project and liberalism as a very important part of the Enlightenment project, something that actually uh, rests on the Enlightenment. And that is the aspiration to arrive at social and political freedom based on deterministic metaphysics. That has never really been figured out and resolved in the Western tradition. On the one hand, you have understanding that a metaphysical sphere is somehow uh, designed, pre-designed, and then you want to construct human society and uh, say something about human relations that would be somehow free. And of course, liberalism, more specifically, uh, has contributed to uh, building of nation states and modern nationalism, but at the same time, because of this alliance with capitalism, it has this intention to uh, expand and go beyond uh, the boundaries of individual nation states and uh, develop a certain version of internationalism. We'll get back to that as well. So. Uh, one thing that we find there is that liberalism, and of course neoliberalism, has actually become uh, an elite ideology once the ruling class became the class of the merchants and bankers and those who were not uh, the traditional power holders in, let's say, medieval uh, Europe. And liberalism, that's why it became almost the default ideology of what we call bourgeois class, because it allowed it to be established as the, not the dominant ruling class and this contributed to the idea that the values of that class that liberalism codified are somehow universal, that everybody should actually adhere to them, including the capitalist system. And this is where uh, there is a heavy reliance on Protestant ideas. We can just uh, think uh, of uh, Weber, uh, but uh, there are also much more recent studies that develop particular aspects of Weber in a very, I think, convincing way. The problem here is, and this is to go back to those unwritten rules, that you can have a functioning system with many unwritten and unspoken rules, as long as those who are in power belong to more or less the same cultural ethnic uh, ideological mindset. So if, in principle, 
uh, those who decide in society are rich white men, which used to be the case uh, throughout the 19th century in the Western world, and of course most of the 20th, then uh, you can sustain uh, those unwritten rules, and you can sustain that kind of democracy. But as soon as uh, you encounter among uh, ruling classes different kinds of ideas, and uh, uh, different traditions, different cultural uh, setups, if you will, uh, this becomes increasingly problematic. And then you need to rely more on explicit rules, but this, of course, diminishes the traditional idea of what democracy and liberal democracy really is about. Uh, and this kind of democratic culture, of course, insistence on that uh, uh, is there to secure that power remains among those elite uh, circles. And this, of course, uh, is something that many liberal thinkers and also liberal politicians simply didn't notice, didn't know, or forgot about, that those at the bottom of the social uh, structure very often opt for strong leaders, even if that may lead them to big problems as long as this strong leader can punish really or symbolically those on top. And this is what we know already from ancient Rome, how uh, more classical Roman Republic collapsed. Not because there was a tyrant, there was a dictator who just all of a sudden corrupted the whole society and uh, imposed uh, himself as the leader, but precisely because there was support from those at the bottom for strong figures against aristocracy, against those who actually have power. And we find that uh, in today's politics, I think, as well, in many places. So now I just want to uh, contrast this or, or, or give a parallel uh, systematization of these different ideas. Mm -hmm. So what the good ideology looks like from uh, this neoliberal perspective. And it looks something like the affirmation of liberal democracy, human rights, free market economics, and uh, uh, economic globalization. And then from this liberal or neoliberal perspective, there is also bad ideology. Uh, and bad ideology is about what sometimes is called illiberal democracy. So they say, well, yeah, there is, maybe there are elections there, and maybe there is democratic legitimacy, but there is no everything else that classical liberalism stood for, so therefore it's illiberal democracy, so therefore it's not really uh, a democracy. Or authoritarian tendencies, and of course conservative international, that uh, uh, many, including uh, those who uh, attended our project and our conferences, uh, wrote about. Then there is uh, this conservative or neoconservative perspective, which also sees good and bad uh, ideologies. So from the conservative perspective, good ideology is about the affirmation of traditional values, like traditional family, religion, whatever that religion, predominant religion happens to be in different contexts. Uh, traditional social hierarchies, very often patriarchal family, for instance. <coughs> National or ethnic identity, Sometimes, but of course it's not that simple, there are different variations among those groups. Uh, democracy, affirmation of democracy within the nation state, or affirmation of national sovereignty. And of course, uh, uh, an attempt to cooperate, so like a positive uh, understanding of this conservative international, that we can cooperate internationally as long as uh, each one remains within their own cultural uh, domains and understanding without trying to interfere with uh, people's affairs in different countries and different cultures. And bad ideology uh, there is seen as this precisely liberal or neoliberal one, as the attack on traditional values, uh, religion, family, uh, moral relativism as, as it's often called, uh, and sometimes because of the affirmation of uh, national identity and nation state, uh, sometimes they see it as globalist elites as problematic, uh, usually associated with international transnational companies. 
Now, very simplistically, then we can say that there is this conservative or neoconservative affirmation of more traditional nation state, sometimes autocratic and also populist, populist nationalism. And there is a liberal or neoliberal uh, affirmation of impersonal state authority, a more strict separation between the three branches of government, and the affirmation of human rights, and very often, as many authors have uh, uh, wrote about, it is not per se necessarily the affirmation of human rights, but rather what is sometimes called the ideology of human rights. We can discuss that a little bit later. And some authors, like uh, uh, Anne Applebaum, also talks about new Puritans as part of this uh, liberal or neoliberal uh, group. It is clear, of course, that these are very uh, rough conceptual approximations of what really is going on all over the Western world, because we find among these groups uh, that we can so simplistically label as a liberal, or neoliberal, and conservative or neoconservative, a whole range of different groups that are more or less uh, similar, and there are, of course, many overlaps. So some of those who are very much in favor of certain kind of internationalism, others are against that. Uh, state interventionists on both sides, and militarists. Uh, uh, climate change is also not that simple. Sometimes those conservatives actually meet some of those on the left when it comes to the climate change against big businesses, for instance, and so on and so forth. But the point being here that both of these, no matter how they may seem different, <clears throat> on all sorts of issues, I think they, they basically remain within the liberal capitalist worldview. They are maybe two ends of that worldview. They uh, make sharper some of the distinctions that have been there or are there among different political parties, for instance. But it essentially they belong to the liberal and liberal uh, capitalist, more specifically, ideological framework. Neoconservatives, therefore, advocate, for example, for nation-state or nationalism. But let us not forget that nationalism is a liberal uh, element of liberal ideology in the 19th century. Uh, alliance with capitalism first inaugurated that because that allowed for the formation of those unified uh, markets in Europe uh, in early modern period. And of course, later on, uh, uh, the affirmation of uh, capitalism and its, uh, uh, in its alliance with imperialism uh, brought an end for some liberals to this uh, alliance with the nation state. And neoliberals, they affirm more clearly or more systematically precisely this capitalist dimension without actually paying much attention to the consequences of their, let's say, policies to a local nation or local population. And both of them stand for more classical liberalism. Both of them tend to affirm imperialism of the good empire, whatever that happens to be, in the Western context we know what it is. Uh, they affirm nature and natural rights, but in different ways. So neoconservatives would uh, claim that those rights should actually rely on a more organic view of uh, social relationships that have to do with family, traditional family and family roles, procreation, stuff like that, while neoliberals or liberals would uh, actually uh, tend to ground them on those more impersonal uh, rights that, again, stem from nature, because nature is understood in a mechanicist way. So that natural-like laws are abstract, and then social laws get abstract. So therefore, uh, if we talk about contracts and stuff like that, this is where they're grounded. Uh, again, natural rights by the concept of nature may, may vary. They go from capitalism. Among conservatives, you will very often, even among European conservatives, hear about some imagined good capitalism that used to be there. So in, in other words, the logic is there's nothing wrong with capitalism per se, 
it is just capitalism is good, but it can be used and misused, and we should actually care about that, not about capitalism. And those who are most radical on the neoliberal end would just say, no, that is really capitalism, more inequality, uh, more destruction of nature and societies, nothing wrong with that. That is what nature is about, and that is what our social systems should be about. Both are internationalists, just different traditional internationalists, and uh, those who are pretty close to uh, transnational companies. And there is, of course, uh, the concept of imperialism, of human rights, where human right uh, ideology is used as a narrative that justifies, let's say, military interventions. And they both claim to be freedom affirming, although I think they are very much against some more fundamental human freedoms and rights. And I think both are false in their both the, the diagnosis of the problem and in uh, the solutions they propose. Now, this means that if we are interested in democracy and freedom, we really should get over the liberal democratic paradigm and acknowledge it's not democratic, it has become very anti-democratic, uh, and we should think in a different paradigm. I mean, there is nothing really radical here, and I'll try to demonstrate. It's actually the, the, uh, the radical in a negative way is uh, the idea that liberal democracy is a democracy. Uh, that means that we should uh, search for more authentic and deeply grounded uh, ideas of freedom and democracy that just is not there within the liberal democratic paradigm, at least not since the 19th century. And uh, uh, I like this formulation, so I'm just going to read uh, A change needs to begin within the existing systems by trying to pierce the solid fabric of existing ideological bubbles in order to create a situation in which today's oppressive madness, which we often call normality, and even freedom and democracy in a radically anti-free and anti-democratic systems, will be seen by more people as an oppressive madness, what it is, that needs to be dismantled in order to expand the horizons of human freedom. That means that we need to uh, reaffirm a couple of things. First, freedom. But that freedom, not primarily freedom attached to property, or freedom to actually invest, or freedom to exploit one another, or freedom to exploit the natural environment. But freedom is a fundamental property of human being. And I'm afraid that that is difficult to do unless you have some metaphysical presuppositions for that. That goes back to the first thing that I said at the beginning, that there is this fundamental collision between uh, the idea that we ought to affirm freedom in the socio-political realm without metaphysical foundations for the affirmation of that freedom. This needs to be picked up. Uh, affirmation of democracy beyond liberal democratic paradigm, which has become, as I said, radically, I think, anti-democratic. How that can be done? Well, different ways. One is to revive more democratic traditions that already exist or have existed uh, in the Western tradition, <coughs> such as anarchism, socialism, uh, self-management, and other uh, similar uh, ideas of social, social organization. And we have many precedents that can be useful. Of course, each context is different, times, are, times change, so I don't think artificially uh, they can be just the uh, transfers from, let's say, 1930s uh, anarchist communities of Spain and work well nowadays in, in North America. I don't think that's that's possible. But I think there is there are significant lessons to be learned from them, and then uh, slowly we can try to change social realities. This includes also uh, respecting diversity and different cultural contexts and the complexity behind that. Very often we tend to use simplistic ideas and models that we just apply and we ex uh, expect them to just to work regardless of the context. This leads not to emancipation, but rather to more oppression. And I think uh, we just uh, uh, ought to think uh, 
much uh, deeply, more deeply, and open up for the complexities that are out there. Uh, and one thing that can help there is what I call the, the, the anarchist method. And that, for me, means nothing else but a constant skepticism toward every exercise of power and domination, regardless of the form it may take, uh, in different, and it takes always different forms in different historical periods. Uh, why I call it anarchist and why I think it's uh, the term that we should use, although I'm not uh, a fundamentalist in that or any other uh, respect, but I think there is meaning to that. We can talk about that, about that more. And of course, we ought to affirm human and human rights and civil rights way beyond how they are understood nowadays. We talk a lot about human rights, especially liberals like to talk about human rights, but then you ask yourself, okay, but why is it that not every human being on this planet has right, uh, which can actually be implemented, to let's say healthcare, or food, or clean water, or how about rights uh, to be protected from uh, uh, digital espionage that that all the corporations conduct, uh, you know, daily? Uh, how about the protection of uh, um, our right to education, uh, to affordable? apartment, place to live in. So all of these things have uh, diminished to a great extent, not to mention workers' rights, uh, that across the Western world tend to be much worse than they were. And even when they existed, uh, they weren't perfect. So I think there is a lot there that needs to be expanded. And of course, we can start seriously think about it once we give up on just a simple rhetoric you mentioned human rights and you know that fixes all the problems but without actually real content and I'm not again certain that that can be done without addressing capitalism and dismantling the capital system. And this primarily goes then for economic justice. We live in a terribly unjust world and it is not any longer that Western societies, rich societies are you know, places where people generally live good and there are some poor societies where people generally live bad. We actually see the process uh, during globalization that all societies nowadays have their rich elites that live mostly just fine and you have a huge amount of people uh, below the poverty uh, line uh, that have extreme difficulties whether being in the western world or being somewhere else. And we also need to rebuild the system of education, the public sphere. The public sphere has mostly uh, disappeared as the sphere of authentic dialogue and discussion that would be the basis for political decision making. What we have most of the time is a privatized sphere that is controlled by private interests, corporations, or in some cases local dictators. Uh, and in that sense, it is another commodified sphere where uh, authentic dialogue is virtually impossible. I don't think that can successfully be done without uh, doing something about education. Education has also become education for the corporate world that trains you not to think, but to mostly absorb certain ideologies, ideological uh, mantras, and then prepares you to just do a job, you know, get a job. But a get a job, what does it mean? Just fit into the existing system. Don't question it, and you cannot question it, of course, if you have huge debt that you need to uh, pay back. So in many ways, what is presented to us as freedom is actually uh, radical unfreedoms that prevent us from uh, being more active citizens. And none of this actually, I think, can be sustainable even if we do many or all of these things unless we uh, try to create a different culture uh, that would not be based on some of the metaphysical presuppositions that are there in the background of liberalism as this default ideology and of course liberal capitalism. 
Uh, and I, I have in mind here primarily uh, uh, the Hobbesian world, where there is uh, an understanding that there is a kind of uh, existential metaphysical crisis and fear between different social actors. And this fear is the basis of social relationships that are meant to secure some kind of uh, survival. Uh, if we don't start, restart to understand another human being as primarily uh, someone without whom we cannot even have our own human identity, personal identity, I'm afraid that none of this uh, would really work. Uh, and this would also require not to abandon human rights by any means or, or even uh, any rights in a, in a social and political context, but rather to have an understanding that appealing to the rights uh, should be just the final line when everything else fails. But in a, in a better society, a more humane society, we wouldn't even need that. Uh, we would have a culture of compassion, of mutual cooperation, uh, where most of the issues would be resolved without the interference of the law and without the interference of power structures that are behind these laws. So thank you very much.